Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're happy to have you here with us um, for this session of our Critical Access Hospital virtual conference. Um, and I will pass you over to my colleague, Wade Gallen, and our special guest, Blaine McKinney. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here for our virtual CA conference. We're excited to kick off the day with a presentation on cost reporting and some of the importance of that. We do want to do a few housekeeping items before we jump in. Um, so everybody's going to be muted, all the participants. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, please type that into the chat. This is going to be recorded and the recordings will be shared with participants following the webinar. And lastly, we would really encourage you to take a short survey after each conference session. This helps us um, really learn what we can do better and uh, what content is most meaningful for you. So we would appreciate your feedback. Again, just a uh, high level overview, Stroudwater, for those who might not be familiar, we're a, a national consulting firm um, covering critical access hospitals all across uh, the states. So here's just an example of our, our range. And we also do that in partnership with our, our sister company, Stroudwater Capital Partners. Um, so we are excited to work with a cause all around and really gain some insight into what's happening on that national stage. Um, it, for any other information, again, this will be recorded and we will provide the, the slides for those who would like them. And with that said, we're going to jump into our first session of the day, which is around cost reports, one of my personal favorite topics. And I know Blaine would probably agree with that statement. They're um, quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting beast to, to tackle here. For way of background for myself, my name is um, Wade Gallon. As you can see, I'm a senior consultant here at Stroudwater and have a background in cost reporting and reimbursement specifically. I started off at a local Medicare administrative contractor moved into consulting and cost report preparation for hospitals and other uh, provider types as well. Did a stint in a health system up here in Maine where I reside, which is where uh, Blaine and I met and were really in the weeds of cost report preparation and review for, for quite a while. Um, prepared cost reports for a mix of cause, PPS hospitals, other provider types. Um, Blaine, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm Blaine McKinney, and uh, like Wade said, um, we met as colleagues when we worked together at a system here in Maine, Maine Health. Um, currently, I'm with WVU Medicine uh, System out of West Virginia and um, have a mix of facilities there, CA, PPS, Soul Community. Um, it ha does have a home office as well, that component. Um, and yeah, just really excited to be here and to share some knowledge with you guys. Fantastic. So just outlining the agenda for today, we're going to touch base very briefly on an overview of car reimbursement and the methodology and why the cost report is important to this. Um, we're going to touch on some cost report best practices. You know, Blaine and I have been kicking, kicking around a number of ideas, and we're trying to figure out what are the most important things to consider when you're preparing and even reviewing a cost report. So we're going to talk about those, and then we're going to go over some common reimbursement opportunities that we see as we evaluate cost reports from, from cause all over the, the country, right? So we notice some things that are consistently challenging. And so we wanted to bring those to you all for discussion and for input. Um, I just wanna start off, uh, if folks wouldn't mind, would love to get a better understanding of, of who on the call prepares cost reports. If you review cost reports, what your, your role is, maybe you haven't ever seen a cost report before, but if you wanna type some of that information in the chat, it would be helpful so that we can get a better sense of the audience and what might be helpful to touch on during the presentation. Um, so folks, feel free to type that in, you know, have you prepared a cost report? Are you aware of what a cost report is? What's your background with it? Um, that would be really helpful. Um, all right, so overview, again, touching really briefly on this, I think most of our, our CA operators on the call or um, CA cost report preparers, our CA cost report reviewers are familiar with critical access hospital reimbursement. But you know, as a critical access hospital, we receive cost-based reimbursement um, for Medicare. And then in some states, Medicaid also offers that cost-based reimbursement. This provides some um, insulation for hospitals. So, you know, critical access hospitals are often small, um, lower, lower volumes typically. Um, 
And so this provides a little bit of, of insulation from some major fluctuations in volumes that can occur. Um, it does not protect a hospital from all financial woes. And so it also doesn't negate the need for prudent cost management strategies, but it, it does help to some extent. And it also um, allows us to consider things that maybe in a non-cost based reimbursement world might not be quite as feasible or it would be a different picture. Um, the cost report is really important to uh, maximizing and obtaining optimal cost-based reimbursement. This is what Medicare relies on, and in many states, Medicaid as well, to determine what your cost-based rates will be. So the Medicare is, is crucial, the Medicare cost support is crucial to figuring out um, your reimbursement. So with that being said, let's see what we've got here. All right, we got a good range of people here. We've got some co-administrators. We have some folks that are brand new to the cost report, um, folks that do prepare the cost report, uh, utilize consultants for preparing their cost report. Um, again, more new folks to cost reporting. So this is good. This is a good, good mix of folks to jump into. Um, so with that said, we're going to jump into our best practices. These are the six um, practices. And again, you know, Blaine and I were, were talking about, you know, what are what are some of the most important things at the, the highest level to understand when you're looking at cost reports and how to prepare and review them? And these were the six that we came up with. So, um, you know, the first one we have is this idea of expense and revenue mapping. So there's a term, it's called the matching principle um, in Medicare cost report speak. Um, and the idea is that when you are preparing a Medicare cost report, you generally have to file these at least annually. There's an expectation that you match your expenses and revenues. So, you know, typically in my prep experience, you know, you will get something, the equivalent of a trial balance or some other financial records that you would use to then put costs and revenues into what are called cost centers on the cost report. And when we're doing that, it, it's important to keep in mind that if we have revenue items in one cost center, we also need to have a matching expense in that cost center. So there are different schedules that do these um, you know, mappings. So we have worksheet A, which does our expense mappings, and then worksheet C, which um, it takes our gross revenues and it uh, puts them into cost centers. So the issue that can potentially happen is that we have mismatched cost and revenue. And what this does is it impacts our reimbursement. And, you know, I, I know Blaine, you and I were talking and this isn't just a, you know, formality. It really does have some impact. I know you were sharing a, a story about, you know, how you've had issues um, related to this in the past. And once you caught those, it ended up being a, a swing in reimbursement. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, just for instance, this year, uh, one of my facilities, a 1231, uh, their cost report was due back on May 31st. Um, and this call, we kept um, focusing in on two cost to charge ratios that weren't really making sense for us. Um, one was the EKG and one was for a respiratory um, clinic. And we noticed that the uh, expenses and the revenues and the worksheet A and C were in the right places. But when we got down to mapping our Medicare PS and R, we really needed to focus in and, and decide um, if that was making sense, that mapping that we had from prior year. And we noticed after um, doing a little bit of digging and some research with the respiratory clinic, that a lot of EKGs were being performed in the clinic and that corresponding revenue revenue from the PSNR wasn't being directed there. So when we made that change, we moved about $400,000 of revenue and it actually swung our settlement figures from a liability to a receivable. So it is a large impact when you find something that your business has kind of shifted and you need to dive in and make sure you're understanding what your cost to charge ratios are actually doing to your settlement. And if there are any opportunities there, you look into them, get in touch with the right people. Like we had to talk to our clinic folks at the respiratory clinic to make sure we were understanding what we thought we were seeing in the data. And then that confirmation led us to a very favorable outcome for this facility. 
it's always good when the swing is in the positive direction yeah. and not the other way around. <laughs> yes, absolutely. But you're right. You could find something that actually is a, um, a detriment to your settlement, but the end of end result for everything is to have everything in the right spot, um, good or bad. But my, my little um, story is definitely a positive. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love it when that happens. Um, and yeah, I think it brings up a great point, right? That we, it's not just your, your trial balance, you're working with, you know, revenue detail files, especially on the, the charge side, as you mentioned, when we're mapping these, it's, it's not always black and white. And, you know, a lot of these mm -hmm. principles that we're going to review, they seem pretty straightforward, but then when you actually get into the details, it's, um, it can be very challenging. Uh, and so, you know, the best practice, again, we're reviewing what we're mapping on our cost report, at least annually. And for many um, cause that do interim cost report filings, it's really important to be reviewing them when you are looking at those interim reports as well. Uh, it's not just something where you can set it down and then forget about it until next year and then pick it up and and, and um, hope everything to, to go swimmingly necessarily. Um, so really important to keep an eye on that and review those at least annually. The next item we have here is our overhead cost allocation. So the Medicare cost report, what it does is it divides up um, your, your expenses and revenues into cost centers, as I mentioned before. And some of these cost centers are um, deemed overhead cost centers. So these would be things like your cafeteria, your administrative in general, your housekeeping. Those are all grouped in a specific area on the cost report. And then what happens is they call it a step-down methodology where all those expenses get stepped down to our revenue generating and non-reimbursable uh, cost centers. And so the important thing that we see in the potential issue is that when we are looking at these overhead cost allocations, sometimes you look at them and you it just doesn't really make sense when you pass the when you think about it in terms of the smell test, you know, like does it make sense that some of our cost centers are getting this significant component of an overhead um you know, cost center, this overhead department, does the overhead department service that that cost center, that other department of the hospital? Um, you know, Medicare has certain methodologies that they use to step down um, costs. They are prescribed and you can find them in the principles of reimbursement if you look online. Um, but it's also important to note that there's the ability to impact that if we think a methodology isn't working. and. Um, you know, Blaine, I don't know if you have any insight into just, you know, areas you've seen um, where we've gone or there's a potential to go awry in, in cost allocation methodologies. But. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for the uh, newbies to cost reporting in the room, um, I, I kind of always like to think about this um, just using one of our B1 um, stat allocations for overhead because um, it's a very uh easy one to kind of focus in on and understand what's happening. And that's our cafeteria stat allocation. Um, so for that, I've, I've always thought about it like, are the FTEs actually going to utilize the cafeteria at the hospital? If the answer is yes, then you're need, gonna need to have a stat in that cost center line. And, and if the answer is no, then you would skip having a stat in that cost center line. So for instance, um, a lot of the cause I know have rural health clinics and is that rural health clinic too far away for that hospital um, employee, rural health employee to actually go to the hospital, use the cafeteria there, is that a likelihood that that's going to happen? So that's a real, real easy one to kind of um, wrap your head around what's happening there and then apply that same logic to your other um, stat stat columns in the B-1. And another thing I like to think about with this too is if any of our stat columns are using um, an allocation method, uh, for instance, you'll see it with gross salaries potentially, that an A6 or an A8 or reclass or an offset has um, changed that overall uh, allocation, then you're going to need to apply those A6s or A8s to that particular item. So gross salaries, for instance, if you had a reclass out of one cost center to another, you would want to take that reclass into account in the overall numbers that becomes your stat. Yeah, no, those are great, great points. Um, you know, we have to be thinking critically about our overhead cost allocations. We can't just, you know, do, and I know we'll touch on this a little bit later too, it, it 
comes into play in a lot of different areas where we can't just say, oh, well, last year we did this. And so this year we're going to do this. You know, we have to really evaluate it. Um, and Absolutely. that's like, that's the best practice right there, right? I mean, just reviewing our cost allocation methodologies. Again, when you file your cost report, you should absolutely be looking at this as a critical access hospital. And then again, if you're doing any sort of interim cost reporting, I would argue that you should probably be looking at and at that time as well, because that has the potential to adjust your expectations for what you will either receive or owe back to Medicare um, at year end. So another really important area to, to consider here. Absolutely. For our, our next best practice, and this is everything here is related to, like none of these best practices are kind of, you know, in a vacuum and, you know, they're all related to some degree. And so, you know, tracking our reimbursement, this is an area that we see quite often. Um, so, you know, tracking Medicare settlements is a moving target, right? When we're dealing with cost-based reimbursement, we have the, the issues of cost fluctuations throughout the year. We have volume changes throughout the year. And depending upon what changes, we could see our Medicare rates um, change significantly, even in the course of a year. You know, we saw this particularly during COVID, uh, where we had an immense usually a decline in volumes matched with, you know, costs that were not equally, um, they didn't decrease in an equal way. And so we had this big spike in our rates in a lot of cases. And, you know, there's obviously nuance to that. Some didn't experience it exactly that way, but that's where we saw in a lot of places. So one of the things that is really can become an issue is, you know, if you're not tracking what you are estimating having to pay back or getting paid from Medicare, uh, during the year, you could be really surprised when it comes to year end and you're filing your cost report. Um, this can be uh, challenging for a number of reasons, right? If you have a significant payable back and you haven't reserved for that, then that can be a very huge hit to some of these smaller organizations, even when we're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and then the other issue you run into is that while Medicare, traditional Medicare settles up at the end of each year, Medicare Advantage doesn't. And so that creates a challenge when we're thinking about, um, you know, how do we balance those two those two payers? And Blaine, I know you're mentioning that you've had um, some of that come up very recently, and and you know some of the challenges there. Yeah, absolutely. I think that some of it too um, just kind of goes back to what what's your strategy with the payers? Um, like like you mentioned, Wade, the Medicare Advantage are not going to settle with us at the end of the year like traditional. Medicare does via the cost report. So um, in some instances, it's it's best to look at overall financial performance of your facility and is it better to keep um, a higher rate being paid from Medicare traditional um, so that you can keep those higher rates with Medicaid Advantage and get paid that throughout the year. And then potentially if you're seeing something that's going to make your rates decline throughout the year, then maybe you just book an, a liability um, for that decline so that you, you're knowing in your reserves um, that you'll owe money back to Medicare traditional via the cost report, but for the MA plans, you wanted to keep that higher rate throughout the year. Um, and that that goes back to kind of looking at your interim rate reviews and how they're being calculated by your MAC and what you can do as a strategy on that. So I think that that's something that um, a lot of people are looking into um, now more than they have in the past as the business has been shifting from traditional Medicare plans into the Medicare Advantage space. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a continual increase in our, you know, MA payers um, for most of the hospitals that, you know, we work with. And it's really important as we're thinking about, you know, when it comes to year end, are we going to be surprised, right? Or are we, do we have a good yeah. sense of what our rates are, um, how they might be changing throughout the year? And then how does that play into, you know, any potential, you know, strategy around this, this area? Um, and, you know, the best practice, monitoring the cost report, really your rates, you know, settlement for sure, but that's just a, a culmination of your rates. Um, so just mon um, monitoring your reimbursement throughout the year. And there are, you know, plenty of tools out there. Um, many folks utilize consultants to prepare their cost reports at the end of each year. And generally they'll offer, um, you know, interim cost report type models that'll help them estimate their settlement throughout the year. So that's really helpful to have. Um, and then we would also recommend, you know, if we see our rates 
changing significantly, really evaluating that and evaluating whether we need to file an interim cost report with our Medicare administrative contractor. Uh, it's a it's an interesting um, thing, and and you know again it takes a lot of takes a lot of work because we're not dealing with kind of a fixed system here. We're dealing with fluctuations in many different areas that can impact our reimbursement. But again, it is the as long as we are tracking and we have some idea, that's better than being completely surprised at year end or or waiting until really late in the year to understand what what we might be getting from Medicare. Um, and again, you know, this, they're all related, right? So understanding service mix, part of that has to do with your payers, but it also has to do with the um, services that you are providing. So as we think about even estimating and evaluating what we might get paid for, uh, by the end of the year through interim cost reporting and using a, a model to try and estimate your third party um, settlements throughout the year, a big part of that is service mix too. What are the services that are being provided and has anything changed from last year? I think that this is incredibly important. And, you know, Blaine, as we were talking, it's not just necessarily at your specific hospital too, but we're seeing a lot of hospitals that are involved with systems now, and it can be at the system level that there might be um, changes that they need to consider. Yeah, absolutely. It, I think that the system level, um, if you're, if you're, facility is part of a system, I think that's really important to monitor as well, because you um, might only work with that hospital, you might, you know, be the CFO or CEO of that hospital, and that's really what your focus is. But then understanding that if your system has acquired a new facility, and they're integrating a new hospital, then that any of those integrated overhead costs are going to be pulled down um, from your facility to cover pieces of another facility that's been brought into the system that year. So you could see changes um, that way through your home office dollars that you're allocated back into your facility cost reports. Um, you could also just see a different mix of integrated services within the system, depending on how long your system's been um, been around. Uh, you could see new integrated services happening. A lot of the times that'll be, um, you know, facilities that have left accounting departments all at one um, hospital facility. And then as the system gets stronger, they are saying, okay, it would be, it would be best for us to integrate all of our account accounting functions at the corporate level. Um, so that would change the dynamics there. Um, another thing I think that's really important also is kind of how your corporate um, structure is charging you for those integrated services throughout the year and making sure you're not getting overcharged for those services through your corporate accounting allocations for the, the services that they are providing you because through um, your A1 related party schedules, you're going to want to have more cost coming back into your cost report from home office than you had to offset throughout the year. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation as well. Um, just a little bit of a deeper dive into it. But I, I definitely think that service mix needs to be understood at both your facility level and then also at your system level if that impacts you. Absolutely. Yeah, you're right. We've got another slide dedicated to home office cost allocation funds. So that'll be good to, to delve into yep. a little bit more. But yeah, absolutely. So it's really, you know, understanding your service mix not even just at the hospital level itself, although that's important too, right? If you're developing a new service line or you anticipate there being some significant change in your services because, you know, we lost a provider and they were um, primary referrers for a specific type of service, that, that could certainly impact us, but also keeping in mind that we have um, allocations from other entities for a lot of our cause now who are more and more moving into these system type relationships. Um, so I couldn't, couldn't agree more, uh, you know, so when we're tracking this reimbursement, when we're trying to understand how our rates are changing, it's really important that we don't just take prior year as, as a basis without questioning, has there, has something changed in the year that we need to consider? Because it can have the potential to really, really impact our rates. Um, and so it's really important for us to keep that in mind. All right, the next one, um, so this brings me back to, I think, as I mentioned before, I started off at a local Medicare administrative contractor. And so I was very much in the weeds of, 
for audits and desk reviews for, for many hospitals in the region uh, up here in New England, where I reside. Um, and this is this is a finding that you know Blaine and I were talking about, and it's really important for us to be considering how these audits and desk reviews play out from a Medicare administrative contractor or MAC perspective. Um, what we're what we're seeing, and you know, Blaine will speak to this uh, just a second here, but um, when it comes to our audits, so each of your cost reports might be audited or reviewed by the Medicare administrative contractor. They're all um, nothing is is completely safe from potentially being audited or reviewed at a higher level by the Medicare administrative contractor. But with the time lag that we can see, um, so you file your cost report, that automatically puts you at five months after your fiscal year end. And then you will generally have some sort of acceptance process through the Medicare administrative contractor. You might get a tentative settlement of some kind. Um, but then it could be a, a decent bit of time before the Medicare administrative contractor actually delves into the cost report and audits it. And so, Blaine, I know you mentioned a specific situation where this was going on and it really created a, a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. So we had a uh, cost report that we went through audit with the desk review audit. And out of that, there were some findings that we would have wanted to incorporate into future years. Um simply for the fact that usually if a auditor, if one year has a finding in it, the next auditor that picks that up is going to instantly look at those audit adjustments and look for the exact same things, um, where things corrected in the next year. Um, we learn a lot as providers out of these audits. So we're not all necessarily from year to year going to catch our own mistakes. Um, and these that the auditors do find years after we filed the cost report. So um, for this, particular facility, um, the cost report filing was 2017. So when you count those years, you've got 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and we just filed 23. Um, so that's six years of cost reports that could potentially have this issue in them. Um, so at that point, I think that what's best there is to understand the impact of this, try to quantify it in, in your future years so that you can at least start getting reserves on your books to account for these audit findings that you know will happen. Um, and as you um, have the availability to amend those, because I know um, if you guys are anything like the systems that I've worked for or the facilities that I've worked for, we're very busy every day. So sometimes it's not just a simple, okay, we know that this is a an issue. We want to amend the next cost report and it gets done that next week. It might be, you know, fourth, fifth, sixth thing in the, the um, to-do list there. Um, another thing that we've been seeing since the max that I've been working with recently are very far behind in their audits. Um, um, we've seen them go from desk review and jumping right into the next audit year um, quicker than we could even have something worked through for an amendment, an official amendment. So um, I think that it's very important to just make sure that you understand what's coming back um, from these audit findings. You review your adjustments and your adjustment letter, and you make sure you agree with what the auditor is doing. It's much easier to... Um, provide support and um, and work with the auditors in that like two week window after adjustments are are um, sent to you to kind of dispute anything that you need to and provide additional support if applicable so that those adjustments don't actually go through an NPR. Um, it's harder to fight something that's been NPR'd and adjusted in a future year because it's, it's already kind of locked down in the max size. So I definitely think that, you know, get get your reserves on the books for any audit findings and then try to incorporate those as quickly as possible into your um, next cost report prep period. Yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a challenging thing to uh, kind of maintain. And like you said, we're always busy. There's always something to do. <laughs> we can't necessarily um, yep. always adjust things immediately as we would like, but certainly an important piece to keep in mind on. And then, you know, our, our, I believe it's our final, you know, best practice here is just really having a review process in place um, for our cost reports. So we have to file these again, at least annually. And um, cost report is really complex. We have so many calculations going on. We've got 
a number of, of nuances that just make their way through. So you could even have every calculation 100% correct. I know most cost report preparation software does a lot of that for you, but even if everything is calculating technically correctly, that doesn't mean that it's 100% accurate because there might be um, some change that occurs. You know, we know um, new regulations are 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 always kind of there and, and things change and um, there could be any number of, of areas where we might miss. And so really, again, the, the gold standard, we know it's not always possible given the nature of, you know, different organizations and where they're at in this, but really having some sort of review process in place for our cost reports, ideally pre-filing, um, but also getting feedback afterward. And uh, yeah, Blaine, do you have any other thoughts on the idea of a review? And Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, the gold standard is, is to allow ample time for that review to happen um, before your five month deadline. So, I mean, I, I think that the best case scenarios are that you can get everything done within the prep work done within four months of year end. And then at that point you have a solid month for reviews to happen and not just the review to happen, but then actual um, changes to start occurring within the prep. So the analysts taking back that kind of, um, work that they've done and and tweaking based on review comments and trying to you know <laughs> spend your uh, the majority of your time on things that will have the highest settlement impact as well um, the most important pieces and then you know maybe at that point you could focus on three of the five or six things that you found um, and then you know that if there's a amendment opportunity that you're going to want to amend for the remaining items um, I think that's a fine approach as well, but just making sure that you kind of try to quantify the dollar impact things will have um, so that you could, again, pose a reserve if there's going to be an, a liability from something you found, um, that kind of thing. But uh, it's definitely cost report season is probably the toughest season that um, anyone who's prepped a, prepped one before goes through. Um, it doesn't really get easier when you get to the review level. Um, it's also still stressful because you're trying to do the best thing for your organization. So um, I think that also kind of plays into this that everyone's on, you know, their most stressful time of the year trying to work through all of this and make sure it's as accurate as possible before filing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I like that. We kind of have to triage in some ways for for these. Um, you know, we can't necessarily get every single thing maybe before for filing, but really, how are we? We have some sort of process in place. I think that that's it's helpful to to try that. But um, yeah. yeah. So again, you know, this is just a copy of your face page of your cost report, and it has an estimate there for you know the amount of time to file a cost report. And I think both Blaine and I can can agree that it's a time consuming process and just furthering really the need for us to be considering, you know, cost report reviews um, in some form or fashion, right? Um, we just, we only know what we know. And so the more eyes we can get on a, a complex document like the cost report, the, the better. Um, yeah. And just quick math on that, Wade, um, that's about 16 um, weeks. Um, so that's about four months, the 674 hours that was on the, the other screen. So that's just 40 hours a week. So um, definitely keep in mind that as, as you're prepping, if this is, you know, you're new to this, it's your first year, a lot of time really does go into these cost reports. Um, lots of the staff have to pull overtime hours and everything to get through everything. So we are spending a good deal of time, you know, making sure everything's as accurate as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that, that concludes the first uh, component or the second component of the presentation. Now we're jumping into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see. This may or may not be applicable to the individuals who are on this call. It really depends on your circumstance. Um, there, there could be a number of these things that don't necessarily apply. But again, as we're looking at cost reports, you know, for all different critical access hospitals across the country, there, there emerges some themes. And so we wanted to bring those to your attention. You know, these are the five that um, we were talking about. There's certainly more, and uh, we just don't have the time today to get into everything in detail. But, you know, the first one is around Medicare bad debts. So essentially, if you are, um, if you have traditional Medicare patients that have a patient responsibility amount that's due, um, and for whatever reason, we aren't able to collect that amount, 
the cost part allows you to claim those as Medicare bad debts. And if everything goes swimmingly and you pass the test of audit, you can receive 65% of those Medicare bad debts on the cost report. The opportunity we often see is, is, you know, a test that we like to use is looking at your Medicare bad debts as a percentage of the total patient responsibility as reflected on the cost report. And if it's below a certain amount, you know, we might want to question, you know, are we claiming all those bad debts? Maybe we just have a, a population that really pays their bills and, and there's no issue there, or maybe there are other factors contributing to it. But, um, you know, there's often an opportunity for us to maybe realize additional bad debts. Um, and so this is a challenge. The challenge is that we have a very um, challenging audit process for this. And I know, you know, Blaine and I have both been kind of in the weeds when it comes to audits and, you know, bad debts. And, you know, I don't know, if Blaine, do you have any insights on, you know, kind of going through those and anything to consider when we're looking at bad debts? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that it's important to make sure you understand how your uh, bad debt figures are being computed out of your um, electronic health record systems. Uh, I definitely think that it's really important to partner with whoever your RevCycle folks or your patient financial services um, people are, just so that you have a good understanding of what you will be able to support during an audit. Uh, this kind of plays back into um, me mentioning earlier that some of the MACs are several years behind where they should be with their audits. So at that point, you could have had system changes and those legacy systems sometimes go into like a sunsetting phase where they're um, just completely phased out of the organization and you might not have all access to all of the documentation that you would have had in that um, legacy system. So it's really important to make sure that your patient financial teams, that services team actually knows like what they're going to have to supply for how many years back. So those kind of conversations just within the organization, I think are really important and sometimes um, reimbursement, even though it is a very important role in a hospital organization, I think sometimes gets like the last thought because we're the last users of that data, even years and years and years later. So I think that's very important. Yeah, that's a great point. We can't be looking at this in a vacuum, right? And uh, I think it's important for those to even understand as you're reviewing and, and maybe it's first time preparing, but what other folks are doing really impacts the cost report and how we're claiming that. So it's a great point. Um, really, this just outlines where you would see those bad debts reported on your Medicare cost report. I'm just going to go through these real quickly. You know, E-3 part five would be your inpatient side and then worksheet E part B on the outpatient side. Um, again, you'll see a total allowable bad debt amount on, on a given line, as well as the adjusted reimbursable, which is just the allowable amount multiplied by 65%. Um, really, what we see is just, we need to make sure we're tracking these as best as we can. We realize it's not, um, it can be very challenging. And so really what we just want to do is ensure we're tracking these as best as possible um, and understanding the formats required. Um, so for overhead cost allocation statistics, and as I'm looking at the, the time now, I think that, you know, we've touched on this quite a bit uh, in the previous best practice around how we just want to be thinking critically about our overhead cost allocations. Um, and so I think that that is really the gist here. We just see a lot of misallocations of cost or potentially um, over allocation to one department versus another that can impact your overall reimbursement picture just really important to be thinking critically, uh, especially as we review it. And um, you don't necessarily have to be in the weeds of preparation to, to understand. And again, some solutions here are things to be aware of, not double counting, um, understanding direct costing versus whether we're allocating things to a department based on a methodology. Um, and, you know, really working with hospital preparers to see, is there a better way we could do this? Is there a way that makes more sense? Um, but again, just for the sake of time, I know we've covered this a little bit before, so we'll just go into related parties, um, which we, we said we would kind of come back to this topic. And so on your worksheet A81, you actually have to report the allowable cost from um, related party organizations. And, you know, I, I know, Blaine, you've had quite a bit of experience with this in, in two different systems. And I just yeah. don't know if you have any thoughts on like the opportunities and things to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just really important to understand what's happening for your organization within the year. Um, you know, as cost report 
folks, we kind of tend to think of, well, after the year is done, then my work really starts because that's when you're, you know, prepping the cost report. But it is important to think about cost reporting the entire year um, that your facility is undergoing potential changes. You know, like I mentioned before, was a new hospital added to your system that's going to draw overhead into that facility and take it away from other facilities? Was it a critical access facility that was added or was it a PPS facility that was added? Um, definitely important, the size of that facility would matter. Uh, larger facilities are gonna draw more resources out of your overhead that your system um, has overall. So uh, lots of things to consider there, um, just keeping an eye on it, monitoring things, talking to the right people in corporate accounting, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Something we need to be, be aware of and really tracking and Understanding your home office too, if you are part of a system, like what are the allocations you're getting and and how might those changes impact your reimbursement? Are there opportunities there? Um, Absolutely. Again, just showing, you know, we're in the cost report and you would see this for those who are unfamiliar, this would be on your worksheet A81 and it shows basically a total amount of allowable costs. That's the amount that you can claim on your Medicare cost report. And then there's an amount included on worksheet A, which is essentially if you pay out any sort of um, fees, any, any sort of adjustments are made on your books, um, reflective of the services we're looking at here, uh, you list those there. And then if you have some sort of a home office or other allocation methodology, it compares the two, and then you get an adjustment for either a positive or a negative. Um, so again, really important as we have more cause moving into system relationships to um, consider this. The other one we see is, is related to, you know, physician uh, standby time in the ED. So the way it works is if you have a physician who um, is, is on standby and they are not providing patient care, uh, you can claim that amount as allowable in the cost report. The challenge that we often see is that many hospitals are still relying on something like time studies, you know, manual time studies that are um, challenging to fill out and maintain in a way that makes sense and oftentimes might not be that accurate. And I know, Blaine, you were mentioning how you've gone to using a different methodology and have even um, examined yeah. that impact. Yeah, there's some electronic timekeeping solutions out there now. Um, one of the companies that's utilized often is called Versa Badge, where it can actually just track through, um, I think it's through RFID and the actual badge, um, what the physician is doing and, and where they are. Um, I think that this would definitely be a better option for some of the smaller facilities, just so that they can claim as much standby time as possible, as much availability time as possible in their cost reports. Uh, we had a couple facilities in my sis current system that uh, were thinking about bringing this on and got quotes from how much it would cost every year to have this um, software essentially implemented and, and working. And when we did the analysis on it, we only had to increase our availability time by 5% to completely cover the cost. That's also an allowable cost on the cost report. It doesn't have to be thrown out via the A8s. So you're naturally going to get a little bit of an uptick there in your reimbursement as well, just for having this expense on your books. So um, it was a little bit of a, once the CFO, um, of that facility that I did the analysis for kind of saw, saw that she shared it with other CFOs within our system saying like, we should all think about this just for the increased reimbursement through our ED. So really, yeah. really cool stuff that's happening. Um, that's kind of outside of what we normally had thought of how we would track this kind of time. Um, another thing, um, I think we could all agree that there. Um, the physicians don't necessarily think of availability time as a positive. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you would get a time study and you'd be like, this just doesn't seem accurate. Um, they, the hours on this are far exceeding what they should have said they were um, working within the ED. So those availability percentages without um, a electronic tracking system or something that's a little bit more robust um, can sometimes be very, very low. And that's just hurting you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, it's sometimes it's convincing folks that you're not trying to monitor their productivity as much as you're just trying to get the reimbursement that is optimal for the, yeah. the hospital. So yeah, absolutely. But yeah, some sort of electronic methodology is, is really good. And, and just so I think the solution here is just making sure we have a good way to track this time. So that way we can realize more reimbursement on the cost report. 
Again, we'd be looking at the AA2 schedule here, which shows you know, the total amount that's paid to the emergency room um, providers. You know, we've got the professional component, which would be the non-allowable piece, the time um, treating patients, and then the provider component, which would be allowable. And so if we can increase that provider component amount by you know, even minimally, it can have some significant impacts on our reimbursement. And then the last one we have here is focus on our cause that have provider-based rural health clinics and essentially the challenge we find. So if you have a provider-based rural health clinic, it's important to track um, visits, the FTEs based on the way the cost report calculates those, and then total expenses related to those provider-based RHCs. We are trying to get to a cost per visit amount that is um, consistent across the board. And so you can run into issues with productivity, um, meeting the minimum standards required for an RHC. You can also um, have issues where maybe you've got expense included in the RHC cost center that uh, might be applicable to a provider that's actually doing, um, you, you know, they're servicing another area of the hospital perhaps. We see this quite often, especially in a smaller cause where we have providers who might be covering um, for the hospital hospital as well as in the RHC. And so there's differences in where they're practicing. And really the opportunity here is, is ensuring that we get as accurate of a cost per visit as we can. Um, and this is especially true as we think about our grandfathered provider-based rural health clinics that have maybe a higher um, AIR cap compared to our um, non-grandfathered provider-based RHCs. But it, it's one of those things where it's really easier said than done. Um, and I know it, it it's very challenging sometimes. I know we were joking about this, Blaine, but like even as simple as finding the right visit count for our provider-based RHC is challenging. Um, yeah, it's you're dealing with different systems and yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Just the visit counts alone can be very challenging, especially like you referenced, if you have a uh, provider that is spending part of their time servicing the RHC and then also part of their time potentially servicing um, the hospital for something, those uh, physicians can actually go between facilities. We've seen them on the same day being in both locations, doing things in both places. That kind of throws a wrench in some of your visit reports and accurately capturing where they were spending their time and how they were spending their time. So all of that, I think, plays into this. And, and definitely um, part of this is making sure that you're not too far below your cap, but also not too far above your cap. Um, there's, there's room on each side that can penalize you. So absolutely. Yeah, no, this is a challenging one. Um, and this just shows on the schedule where you would you would see some of this again for time. Um, well, this will all be available for everybody here. Yeah, again, we want to make sure we're reviewing really all the information we're pouring into our provider based rural health clinics. So that's visits, that's FTE counts, that's the amount of expense we have. We want to get, we want to be getting the RHC specific information in there. And again, that's much easier said than done. Um, and with that, uh, that's the end of our presentation. I apologize, we're a little over from where we were anticipating being. Um, but definitely these slides will be available and this presentation will be available. So if anybody has any questions, they can feel free to reach out to either Blaine or I, and we'd be happy to um, answer those questions or even commiserate with you as you go through cost reports. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Brian, who will be discussing um, financing, a very important topic. Wait. Well, I really appreciated getting into the details of cost reports. Um, even as an English major, I've appreciated how important cost reports are and how they're essentially a big puzzle. And I liked how you both were able to kind of talk about some of the key elements of that puzzle so that folks can use that going forward. And as you suggested, we are going to kind of shift gears now into uh, looking at long-term financing and how we can reliably source capital for uh, projects to meet the needs of our community more effectively um, going forward and principally use the USDA financing structure for that. So let me uh, just take a moment here to get my slides shared. All right. Can everybody see the slides now? Yep, we can yep. see them. 
Great, thanks, Wade. Um, yeah, so we recognize, you know, similar to cost reporting, that the idea of securing capital for long-term investments in our facilities, equipment, and infrastructure is a really, um, you know, nuanced and challenging set of tasks. Uh, so we're going to kind of break that down today and really use this idea of getting past stop. Um, so many organizations have, you know, started the conversations around what we could do with our facilities over the long term. And uh, they really just unfortunately don't go anywhere too often because we run into constraints and we absolutely understand that there are a series of best practices to avoid that happening going forward. It really starts with this idea that where we as leaders focus our energy and what we're talking about are becomes the strategic strategic agenda for our organizations. So um, I'm a huge advocate for making sure that we are uh, tending to short-term operational issues, you know, cost report kind of things, and then also considering some of those longer-term strategic issues like facility investment that aren't going to happen unless we provide it some time and attention as leaders. Um, so this presentation really is focused on how do you do that? Where do you start to focus so that you get some traction or purchase you know, from the outset with facility uh, projects? Uh, Scrubwater Capital Partners, as you heard in the introduction today, is a, a subsidiary of Scrubwater Associates really focused 100% on working with the financial markets to be able to guide rural communities through the process of securing capital and helping translate and serve as liaison in many ways between what you do day in and day out operationally and what the uh, blenders and others are looking for in terms of being able to support projects going forward. So the basic question is, how do you even get started? And the, the first thing that I would say is, it seems very obvious, but understanding what problem we're trying to solve, where is the need in the community, um, Commonly, this is in areas for outpatient services because many of our facilities we know were built you know, back in the Hilberton era or you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago and designed for a very different type of healthcare than exists today. So having expansion of outpatient services and, and creating spaces that help keep more people local for care appropriately is one of the most common objectives of a facility investment. And when we're able to connect the needs in our community to what we're investing from a resource perspective into our infrastructure, it really gets us off to the, to the right start. But unfortunately, you know, that in and of itself is not a compelling enough vision or purpose to move a project through with this level of complexity successfully. So the next step, then is really to put together a clear project plan, uh, identifying what are those resources that we need in order to successfully secure financing to execute an infrastructure project, and how do we how do we help everybody um, that's going to be involved understand what the road is that we're that we're following here? What are those best practices? And then the last thing that I would say is even with a great plan in place, there needs to be active management of, of the plan. Um, so having a project management system or some kind of overall project plan that everybody signs off on with timeframes, accountabilities, you know, that is a great starting point. And then the other thing that we really see it's important is to stay in communication, and particularly not just from the hospital team, but from the third parties and other consultants that are supporting the architects, the engineers, et cetera, making sure that they're talking with each other through the process is really a, cre a critical success factor. We use this analogy of a financing, of climbing a financing mountain. Um, this series of seven steps is really mapped to the application requirements for the USDA Community Facilities Program. Um, specifically providing the third party reports and the analysis that they need to complete their underwriting to provide loan support. Uh, for today's presentation, we're really gonna be focused down here at this stage one, which we call base camp. Um, and I think very similar to climbing a mountain, 
base camp is where we are really making sure that before we start um, you know start out climbing that we're prepared and that we've got the resources in place to set ourselves up for success and that analogy is really important particularly with a capital project because of that complexity that I mentioned and the number of moving parts and frankly the the magnitude of the dollars that are being spent you know if we are investing 15 20 million dollars into an initiative those are big stakes and we want to make sure that we we do everything humanly possible to minimize those risks and not have uncertainty and doubt creep into the process and then start to potentially unravel it so base camp today is where we're going to focus uh, our attention and in, in terms of helping you understand the best ways that you could set yourselves up for success in the future. Before I do that, though, I think it's really important to make sure we're on the same page with a couple of trends from the industry. Um, so I'll review this relatively quickly, but construction costs is obviously a key driver. So, you know, essentially what's the underlying cost per square foot for building a healthcare facility? Um, what you can see here on this chart is that from 2012 to 2021, according to the Federal Producer Price Index, there was about a 2.1% average annual growth per year. You know, some years it was a little bit higher, some years it was a little flatter, but if you average that out um, through that entire period, it was 2.1%. Now, the challenge that we saw beginning with the pandemic was the inflation that was happening in the broader market really hit healthcare construction costs hard. You know, the supply chain issues, all of the things that you read about in the news really became um, a key factor in the underlying driver of an increase in costs. So over that two year period, for each of those two years, there's an average 17 percent growth in those years. Um, having supported about a dozen different projects during that period of time. I can tell you it was a really big challenge because as soon as budgets were being done, they were kind of out of date. The good news is that in 2023, we got a little bit of relief. Um, so things flattened out and declined actually marginally by 1.4%. So we can see here, you know, that the the really the the one of the reasons I want to share this information is because construction costs are growing year after year. And if we have needs, which I would venture to say, and most, if not everybody on the call here has some capital needs. Um, even in replacement critical access hospitals, we see subsequent projects coming up to build on that success. So if we if we have needs, the the bar, so to speak, of being able to afford the cost of developing new space, renovating new space, um, expanding, that bar is only getting higher and higher. Now, from an interest rate perspective, it's an interesting story because you know things are a little bit different. Um, this is a graph of the U.S. Treasury interest rates for uh, short term, which is the uh, yellow line here, and then longer term loans, which is this dark teal line. And you can see from 2007 down to 2020, uh, long term rates, the dark teal line, were kind of generally trending down. You know, there were some periods where things spiked, and these are market changes that happen on a regular basis. So you know, there's not a whole lot that we can control about these rates, but we can kind of see, you know, things were generally trending downward. Then starting in 2020, we had a spike through 2021, things moderated a little bit, and then really spiked up pretty substantially in 2023. One of the key drivers in the marketplace at that time, um, if you may recall, is that in 2023, we started to see a couple bank failures. Um, there was stress in the lending environment. So that was starting to drive rates up um, in the marketplace. And it, in fact, some of the other macroeconomic factors um, you know, also started to drive up short-term rates. So in today's market, a loan for a two-year construction term and a 30-year permanent loan are pretty close to one another, interestingly, which doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think of it. But again, there's a lot of macroeconomic factors here that are well beyond the scope of my comments today. So that's kind of a level setting um, here. Uh, I have a problem with my slide. But 
as we kind of get started, it's, it's important, I think, two takeaways from that data. Number one, when we look at interest rates, they are um, you know, higher than they've been, at least in the immediate past, not um, historically high by any stretch. I mean, certainly folks that have been around a long time and you know, seeing the rates in the late 70s and 80s, early 80s, we know that rates were astronomically higher than they are today. But the key point I would offer relative to that data is interest rates are going to be a, on a cycle. They're going to go up, they're going to come down. Construction costs, not as much of a cycle. You saw, you know, that's kind of a steady climb over time. And even when they come down a little bit, they moderate by a percentage, but we had huge increases prior to that. So it didn't come back to baseline. That to me creates a really compelling case study for uh, our interest and attention as leaders to be focused on how do we make our facilities a priority in our strategic plan because the bar continues to get higher and higher from a cost perspective to construct anything in the healthcare space. So um, with that kind of call to action, we come back to this question of how do we make sure that we're prepared? You can see here that we've got kind of three primary recommendations to get started. Um, look at the USDA Community Facilities Program. Um, I'll share some information on that here just in a moment. Uh, create yourself a plan of finance and get a project budget set in place. Um, under you know, Help communicate to the project team, to the architects and the designers, what resources you have uh, available to be working with so that they're working within those constraints and designing things that you can actually afford to implement as opposed to ideas that are well beyond your capacity from a financial perspective. Um, and then this idea of building the project team. I mean, it really does create uh, a lot of uh, help to make sure you have the right people on board and the right people in the right seats. So we'll go over a little bit of what those key functions are and what those best practices. Bottom line, uh, you can see here in the uh, slide is, uh, you know, we, aspirationally, we want to be able to invest in our facilities, but let's not rely upon, geez, you know, we hope this is going to all come together. Let's be very deliberate and follow a best practice. So in terms of the USDA Community Facilities Program, a couple of really key things to hit. Um, number one, they have a lot of resource, about $3 billion annually in funding. That's for all types of community facilities. Healthcare tends to be about 50% of that um, year in and year out. It's about half of their portfolio. So, you know, billion and a half dollars is real money. <laughs> There's a lot of resource going into communities now. And I think one of the key questions of leadership is, you know, how do we make sure some of those resources are coming into our community? Uh, the current interest rate for those loans is 3.5%. Uh, the repayment period is up to 40 years, um, and that is actually a fixed rate. So USDA you know, doesn't get into a lot of these day-to-day -day normal fluctuations to what's going on in the marketplace. They really want to make it easy and smooth that out for folks that are in their loan program. So great um, rates and great way to start. From an eligibility perspective, not a lot of challenges here. Most of the critical access hospitals in the country would be you know, easily eligible under USDA's guidelines, uh, not-for-profit or public entity, located in a rural area serving a rural population. Um, specifically, what that means is the municipality where the project is located needs to be in a community of 20,000 people or fewer to qualify for the direct loan program, the 3.5% rate or 50,000 people and fewer to qualify for a sister program called the Guaranteed Loan. Um, rates on that are not quite the same, but you know, understanding that we have uh, you know, communities in rural areas that are slightly larger maybe than 20,000 people. Another great thing that I think about the program is it does not require a history of being profitable year after year. When we started actually with the very first critical access hospital, capital project in the country in Del Norte, Colorado. It was funded by the HUD 242 program at the time. This was around 2001, 2002. They actually required five years of profitability. And that was written into the regulations. They were inflexible on that, but it really disqualified a lot of 
hospitals from even considering it because having five years of year, year after year profitability is uncommon um, in the field. USDA's program uh, is very mindful about not competing with the private market. So there is a requirement to make sure that we can demonstrate that the project would not qualify for a commercial loan on the same rates and terms. That's kind of a box checking issue. It's not hard to do. Uh, we know that there are not tons of banks out there clamoring to throw rural healthcare money at these kinds of rates. Um, so, you know, but it's worth knowing that that is a, you know, an important part of the program. And then the last part uh, here, before I get to the final part on this slide is there's this great technical assistance program now that USDA has established in partnership with the National Rural Health Association, NRHA. Um, they, they've got a broad range of services around capital acquisition, debt capacity analysis, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, really, you know, how do you get started? And then they also have for um, existing organizations that have loans, if you know if there are some difficulties, they have resources set aside to to bring in outside resources and kind of look at what's going on and help correct that situation. Finally, um, it's important for everybody on the call here today to realize that these are resources that are for long-term capital, um, uh, long-term capital. So real estate construction equipment. It does not allow for if we're standing up a new service line, you know, and we need some operational or working cap, working capital, um, this is not the program that's going to be able to provide you those resources. But the, you know, the depreciable capital items themselves um, are very much included. The construction and equipment um, development is subject to the Build America Buy America program, um, that really does increase the responsibility of the contractor to document where materials are coming from and how things are doing. Um, it places a premium, depending on who you talk to, it might be between another eight and a 10% increase over those higher rates that we, that we talked about earlier. Uh, but it does not require what are called Davis-Bacon prevailing wage requirements. So this is effectively having to pay non-union la non labor, union labor rates um, in some federal programs require uh, that to happen. The USDA thankfully does not. So that's a, a favor or benefit to us. In terms of getting started, one of the things that we like to make sure everybody gets on the same page with is what's called this plan of finance. As you can see, this is really being able to make sure that for all of the things that we're using resources for our total project costs, how much is it going to cost us in direct costs? How much is it going to cost us to have the consultants and the accountants and the architects and the engineers to provide their reports? Um, so we understand, you know, how much the project will take in total for us to execute. That's our uses of the financing. And then we're going to be able to match that to different sources, starting with equity. Um, we talk a lot about borrowing money. But there's no reason to borrow money if we have other resources to put into a project and we can diminish our reliance on the debt aspect itself. So starting with equity, we know some of us have operating reserves um, just as, as it relates to our working capital account. Uh, we have funded appreciation accounts. You might take on a fundraising or a capital campaign or look into grants to supplement what you're doing. So it's always important to start with equity before we start looking at debt in the form of these USDA loans or bonds in some circumstances. So here's where I really wanted to get into the idea of how do we understand debt capacity itself? This is really a, a key starting point. I can't emphasize this enough. If you only take away one thing from the comments that I have today, it would be how important getting our debt capacity uh, estimated at the beginning of the process is really to serve as guardrails. So it starts with what is debt going to cost us in, in today's marketplace? What are the current rates? You know, you saw the trends, they vary regularly, but let's, we've got to pick a spot, pick a lane and go um, and really estimate what our debt payments would be for a project of, you know, a certain size relative to those market rates. And then, ultimately compare 
the amount of money that we that we'd be committing to repay over time to how much we are generating regularly as it relates to income available for debt service. Two aspects to that for critical access hospitals. One is what is our historical cash flow been um, as measured by EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And then what is the impact of cost-based reimbursement from the proposed project when we add in the project capital to our balance sheet and we look at the annual depreciation, which we're going to get cost-based reimbursement on, and then also the interest expense um, that, we're, that we're incurring. So we, we compare these numbers into a measure, a metric that's called the debt service coverage ratio. And we want to have something that's at least a 1.1 to a 1.25. So you can kind of see that is the cash flow and cost-based payments uh, summed up to, together divided by the annual debt service coverage payments. So if we have a ratio of 1.1 to 1.25, what that's really reflecting is that for every dollar in the denominator, which is our debt service payments, we have a dollar and 10 cents in the numerator, two dollar and a quarter, which is our cash flow. So essentially what it's saying is we're generating between a dime and a quarter annually of extra cash flow per dollar of debt service. It's basically the cushion. Um, and USDA, like any other lender, doesn't want you to borrow right up to 100% of your um, you know, debt payments. So they want to make sure that you have a cushion for operations, obviously, you know, for disruptions um, from a year-to-year -year perspective in terms of what's going on in the marketplace, et cetera. Last point is you know, really underscoring this idea that the one thing that I hope you take away from this is that this idea of debt capacity really serves as guardrails for us to be able to move forward, specifically by being able to translate the resources we have and giving good guidance to those folks that are working hard on our behalf, the architects, the engineers, the feasibility consultants, et cetera, to make sure that we're all kind of working within the same ballpark. The way that we suggest doing that is by starting with an allowance for construction costs. And the way that you determine what your allowance looks like is by understanding that the construction is not the total budget. We have all of these other um, costs, soft costs associated with uh, implementing a project. So roughly construction is 75% of a total project budget in most capital projects. When we take our debt and our equity, we add that together from our prior analysis, our debt capacity and our equity, and then we take three quarters of that. That effectively becomes the allowance for our construction budget. And we then strongly suggest that you work with architects and engineers to um, implement a project within the construction budget. So the way that that really practically works is if we know what the construction budget is in total, the architects, the, the cost planners, et cetera, will know generally what a project looks like on a cost per square foot basis in your region. And then really what you're solving to is how much space can we build, renovate, rehab, change in order to still make the math work? You know, We know a cost per square foot is largely outside our control because that's what's happening in the marketplace. Um, so the major factor here that we control in our planning process is the overall size of the facility that we're either creating or improving. So getting into the idea of project team, um, it really starts at the top. Um, it's critically important to have the board of directors be engaged in this process to you know, evaluate, um, you know, understand that debt capacity, to know that um, executing a capital project often requires outside debt, I recognize that in many of our communities, that's a huge lift because being from a rural area, I know that rural people are very proud to, you know, to make do. And we've made do for a really long time within rural healthcare. And that has led us to where we are today, which is frankly too much out migration from our communities for services that we can very much be providing safely and locally. Um, that has an economic impact, not just to our organization, but to our, our communities, because those dollars recirculate over time. So having the board of directors be on board, pardon the pun, is really, really important. 
Uh, we often see that there's a building committee associated with that as well, because there's a lot of input that's that is helpful through the process. Um, and it can take up too much of the whole board's time. So they often set a, board, a building committee in place. And then of course, the executive management team, the CEO, CFO, CNO, um, you know, all the C-suite folks are, are really then charged with, with working within those constraints to bring a project to fruition. Key people um, or, or positions as part of this process on more of the technical side of the, what you're going to build. Architects, engineers, obviously, you know, key factor to get the right folks on board. Um, an owner's representative is essentially somebody who is very familiar with the construction process and is hired and is part of the hospital team effectively. And they're the, the folks that are really charged primarily with reviewing the information from contractors and making sure that that's normal for your region. You know, they're, they're good at executing projects. They've been through many construction projects and, and they're there to really be your voice of reason to make sure that what's happening is, you know, is above, is above the table. Um, there are also consultants on the technical side, particularly around environmental um, the USDA has specific regulations around reviewing the site. Uh, we know that many of our sites are, again, 40, 50, 60 years old, and they have contaminants on them that need to be remediated, whether you're financing with USDA or any other type of, of source of financing. Um, so having an understanding of that in this process and getting that consultant on board is really important. Uh, we also see the idea of cost estimating being a, a, an important um, team member here, really in the USDA's program, because they have very specific requirements for what they call free and open competition in the selection of contractors. And if a contractor, for example, is involved in providing cost estimating support early on to a project, they are then precluded from actually bidding on that project later on, because according to the agency's regulations, they've had essentially inside information to um, to what's being done that would give them a competitive advantage over other potential contractors. So we strongly recommend getting an independent uh, cost estimating consultant um, in the process to avoid any potential problems in that particular way. Then on the finance side of the equation, uh, we have you know consultants that are coming in to do feasibility studies. Um, the USDA requires an examination level financial feasibility study, which is essentially an audit of your financial forecast and your plan to repay the project. So it's a great belts and suspenders check. You know, it should not necessarily re re result in any surprises because if you've done a good debt capacity study, when you get to your feasibility, you're again, effectively checking the boxes and those folks are making sure that everything, you know, is done according to Hoyle. And um, again, should not have any surprises. You should not get into a full feasibility study you know, with your fingers crossed, hoping that somehow the numbers are going to work out um, if you've gone through the process correctly. We also have financing consultants. In many ways, that's what Stradwater Capital serves as, is making sure that you as an organization have multiple options to look at as it relates to who you partner with as a lender. Some communities like to work with their local lenders, but some local lenders frankly have restrictions and challenges to be able to fund the types of projects that we're gonna be developing because of their own lending um, capacity and constraints. And these are very big projects for many rural communities. Again, maybe 20, $25 million per project. Now, in terms of things, um, as we wrap up here today, that I would say are really important to look at is, you know, let's make sure that the folks that are supporting us through this process understand rural healthcare, that they're not folks from the big city who are seeing a critical access hospital as a small version of a academic medical center. Um, as I mentioned, we also think it's really important to align this team, make sure everybody is on the same page with the project plan, and then that, that project plan is actively managed. This is the seven steps coming back to the overall process, having the base camp 
um, idea here, our, our readiness, you know, well established now after today's comments, and then really kind of just give you an, a preview of what's to come. The next step in the application is what's called a preliminary architectural report. This is really a document that, that clearly links what the project is doing and how it is meeting a, a clear community need. We then go through those environmental reports from USDA's perspective, a phase one site report and an environmental report. Um, we have the financial feasibility report, and then we have an appraisal report that is essentially another person organization coming in and looking at what's being created and saying, is this going to generate more than the debt's worth of value? So it's an, you know, yet another kind of check in the process for USDA to make sure that everything that the project is being proposed to do is sustainable and um, affordable. We submit the complete uh, application. Effectively, one of the things that's a best practice here is there's been often a fair amount of time that has elapsed between each of these different stages and new information comes to the table, um, things change over time. And so one of the key things to do before finalizing your USDA application is to make sure that everything still lines up, that we have a budget, a common budget, you know, that if things have evolved, that we're not using numbers from, you know, one report inappropriately um, and before you know putting in to another report etc uh, we submit that loan application usda does underwriting at multiple levels uh, the usda state office does an initial review of the loan application there are what are called asset risk managers at the national level that are really specialists and many of them are specialists in healthcare. care um, they review the application and then ultimately there is a national office a loan committee that reviews the materials so there's a number of lots of different perspectives you know on the application itself the usda is very mindful to make sure that the program is self-sustainable and it does not have a lot of default with bad loans that have been made ultimately what you get when you're at the top of the financing mountain is a financing commitment those are called letters of conditions um, it really specifies the um, covenants and other requirements of the loan, um, a really important document to review. Um, but that's really the process here. So, you know, it sounds kind of easy, but obviously there's a lot of side quests and paths as you kind of move through climbing the financing mountain here. And with that, I'm, I think a minute over, but I think we caught up, uh, made up a little bit of time today in our, in our presentation. Um, Hillary, any questions you've seen come in? Hi, Brian. Um, I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, if anyone right. does have a question, you can go ahead and uh, quickly type it into either the Q&A or the chat. Um, but it looks like we're all set on questions, Brian. Thank you very much for your presentation. Excellent. So I think we're going to then shift to our next presenters, which are my colleagues, Julie and Shad, to talk about the leadership impact on clinic performance. So let me get rid of my slides here. Uh, figure out where my controls went on Zoom. Wonderful. Thank you, Brian. As um, Brian was saying, I'm Julie and my colleague, Shad Richie is gonna put the slides up for us. So thank you for, um, attending today and thank and we realize that we're the only thing between you and and a, a delicious lunch so we will try to make this as um as interactive and um pertinent as we can we do have a couple of survey questions in our presentation that will help to uh, give us a feel for what you guys are thinking so thank you for sharing the slides um chad i really appreciate it if we want to go ahead and get started we're here to talk today about the impact of clinic leadership on overall hospital performance and really that's evolving in healthcare as as an industry and, and as a value-based care component. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Jeff. 
Yeah, that sounds good. Well, we are really excited to be able to talk about this. We heard about cost reports, and then we heard about um, capital projects. So we're going to switch gears, like Julie said, and we're going to talk a little bit about leadership, which we feel really strongly about, and how organizations really need to invest in their practice managers. Um, we know, and we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but we know a lot of times in rural communities, managers are promoted a lot of times from within. Maybe they have a long tenure there. Maybe they are just outstanding individuals. Um, but a lot of times managers uh, don't know a lot of things to do when it comes to practice management. So we're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the good qualities. And I will say, um, just to kick it off too, I really feel like, I really feel strongly about practice managers. I started out as a practice manager in my career. And um, practice management is probably one of the most difficult jobs in healthcare. A lot of times hospital uh, folks will say, oh, hospital is open 24-7. Well, clinics are, are open pretty much 24-7 too when it comes to being a clinic manager. And um, not only do they have to deal with patients, they also have to deal with providers, but then they also have to deal with the leadership from the organization. So they have a lot of people that they have to work with on a daily basis. So with that said, we'll kick it off. Wonderful, wonderful. So today our objectives, is, as Shad was saying, are <clears throat> to really talk about the most important traits of an effective practice manager. The, you know, how important the selection process can be, especially in our rural markets. And what happens if organizations don't, do not invest or develop practice leaders? What, what can the impact be clinics and to the hospital? And how the clinic bottom line is impacted when practice leaders do or do not have strong developmental training and guidance. All right. So what we have now on the screen is basically um, a snapshot of what um, we feel like are best practices in terms of what are the competencies of, and traits of a good practice manager. Which is why we feel like that an organization needs to have a good developmental program. Um, some maybe they work with outside organizations. Uh, such as MGMA or other institutions. But, um, you know, one of the, the biggest components that is top on the list is staffing. If a good manager um, is, you know, has the ability to recruit and select the right individual, that's going to make his or her job much easier. It's going to help the um, physicians as well as the other teammates on on staff. We know with the pandemic, there's been a lot of turnover in practices. So I'm going to show a quick um, snapshot of information from MGMA. You'll see that um, 2020, 2021, there was as much turnover, at least the data didn't show that. But in 2022, there was quite a bit of turnover. And we know that through the pandemic that happened. People were changing jobs and change jobs quite frequently. What this does though, what it Im impacts the practice manager because the practice manager sometimes has to fill in for those um, staff that staff positions that are vacant or maybe they're sick. So that takes the practice manager away from their daily duties and be ineffective from a strategy or um, just trying to do their managerial uh, job. Yeah, I agree, um, Shad. It's it's the more stable we can have in in the staffing um, pension role, the better the clinic will run because you don't always have people that are in training, and um, you can really establish some strong processes. You know, the ability to manage and prioritize these functions on a daily basis can be a skill in itself. Um, and one of the reasons that the practice managers are, are a little bit different than the hospital managers is not a lot of departments register their own patients outside of registration. So that adds a whole other component to it. Um, you know, clinic offices can become more of a focus for value-based care. And I think it's really important that we talk about that today. The ever-changing field of healthcare, the management of clinic 
becomes critical, a critical piece of a successful medical practice. And these are kind of the legs of um, a couple of stools that we have on the screen. Because value-based care is impacting clinics more than it is the hospitals currently or any other healthcare setting. And that, that's really unlikely to change. Um, value-based care has really progressed in the clinics. So it's important that hospitals and leaders realize how having a strong leader can get it all done and manage it really well is important to sustain these practices and to maximize the levels of growth and reimbursement going forward. So provider practices have always been an important component of healthcare, but the perspective of change has focused on primary care practices by uh, the industry really, and how they are managing these eight items listed above. One of the reasons that many of the providers have become hospital employees is because of the challenges that we're talking about and how do you manage that and, and manage it well and successfully from a financial perspective. The ability to manage all this and to get paid for the work that's done is um, it's more important than ever. As you've seen post COVID, a lot of hospitals and clinics are struggling. So the evolution of clinic reimbursement has really progressed over the last five to 10 years and changed many of the priorities in the clinics. It, it's really been a bit of an upheaval that people don't talk about a lot. It used to be important to manage the clinic daily schedule and, and now managing the patient's health is what's expected of these clinics. And, and really the EMRs weren't built for all of that. However, during COVID, a lot of the insurance companies really worked on their computer systems and are able to manage that in a different way. And they expect us to do the same. Managing the patient's health includes numerous indicators that are defined for us, like uh, you know, blood pressure, glucose, medication management, treatment of chronic conditions. The offices are now expected to really have an active role in how the patient is managing those and, and no longer accepting that that's just what the patient's, uh, you know, that's just what their glucose is going to be, but actually impacting their health. It's also become a situation for the clinics where if they do not manage the patient's health overall, the insurance company will work to take over that patient's care. So we realize that um, we're all here to continue to grow and to retain these patients. And, and in these rural, um, rural communities, many of these patients are very committed to their providers, but the clinics are, managing, are struggling to manage the practice and manage the data that's being pushed to them excuse me, from insurance companies and, and tasks associated with the data that it's asking them to coordinate the care for the patient and also working to retain their own patient base so the insurance company does not become the substitute for a primary care physician. And uh, it, there are a number of commercial insurance companies that will actually say, if you don't respond to this fax or this email within three days, then we will go ahead and do X, Y, and Z for the patient. And it really takes over some of the things that the primary care offices are providing now and, and can have a long-term impact if we're not really paying attention to it. Yeah, to piggyback off that, Julie, real quickly, on the screen, um, quality is obviously a big thing that you're talking about um, mm -hmm. in practice management. Um, it's really important for practice managers to understand how you have to uh, really do chart prep before the patient is seen so that you can ensure that um, you're taking good care of that patient and you're capturing everything that they need, whether it's a colonoscopy, mam mammogram, pap smear, all of those things. And then the other component that we see in the rural, rural communities is compliance because a lot of, if you're an RHC, you're, you're gonna have to be prepared for audits. So it really is important for hospital leaders to really educate practice managers on what to expect if joint commission or the state were to come in and um, audit based on the RHC designation. There, there's clearly a lot to think about for these leaders. So, you know, the, the leadership skills that we listed here are <clears throat> They're really a, a, a strong driven leader. The personal drive to provide the best service, care, and follow up to patients and providers needs to be a key component of a strong clinic leader. To never accept anything else, to lead that by example, and to um, really be obsessive with follow through. Always communicating with your team and always communicating with professionalism, 
always striving for better performance and solutions and <clears throat> never accepting, you know, this is the way it's always been, but continuing to uh, work to improve everything that we do in the clinic. Yeah, for sure. And these are some of the softer skills that sometimes um, people can learn. Um, and then sometimes people can't learn these skills. But hopefully a lot of the practice managers that you have the, that you're working with have these these skills or can learn them. Uh, the other thing that um, I would say when it comes to some of the soft skills that is we all know that in practice management, no day is ever the same. So a strong leader, a practice manager is really going to have to be adaptable. Um, we know there's going to be people that are going to call out. Physicians may call out and we have to reschedule a whole schedule for of patients. Um, so practice managers are going to have to juggle many, many things and lead the team um, in a positive way so you can manage the day to day challenges. It's true, you know, and we have pride and ownership on here. We think it's really important to create that pride and ownership within the team. Really, that takes um, a strong leader. But the recognition of how the office functions is a product of the team. And, and they need to be able to rely on their manager to be there whenever they have a problem, but also on each other. So bringing the team together to all work towards the same goals. And some of those goals have changed, like I mentioned. Some of them are, how are we managing the patient's health? And how are we making sure that we have all of the data we need for our visits? And how are we actually pushing forward in ways that we may have not in the past? So empowerment is, is key to a real change and development. Environment of ownership and pride for the clinic practice and team. Financial implications of various decisions. Um, within the clinic. So that it it really it really does um, it really does take a strong person to handle a lot of the things that we're talking about and lead it in the direction that the industry is going. Yeah, and uh, the next item is relationship builder from personal experience. I can really say that um, the practice manager really needs to understand how important it is to build a strong, um, relationship with not only your teammates and your employees, but also your providers. Um, you need to be able to maintain honesty and professionalism in any situation that may come up. It could be stressful, but um, having that relationship with your team is really going to be beneficial. If for some reason um, the practice manager ever loses that trust of the providers and maybe the teammates, it's really difficult to get that back. So um, it's really, it's important for organizations to think about, well, how can we uh, teach our leaders how to um, create better relationships and and how, how do they go about doing that? Thing that they need to do. And I, I completely agree with what you're saying, Chad. It's just, you know, the ability and integrity to, to be open and to personal growth and feedback are keys to leadership skills. And that includes, you know, how you are as a relationship builder, how you create pride and trust, all of these things that we're talking about. You know, sometimes it's hard to hear the things that people share with us in, in professional development, but it's also an important part of a strong manager's role as someone that, that can take feedback and act upon it. So while they might be a great taskmaster and they might have been with the organization for a long time, they really need to be coachable. And it, it's it's one of the most important leadership skills um, of everything that we have listed. So we just wanted to make sure that we talked through the fact that they're, they're always gonna continue to learn and grow, but they need to be accepting of that growth. Yeah, for sure. And then that, that kind of coincides with problem solving. And as practice managers, we all know that we're, we're fixers. Um, this is a good quality, but a lot of times um, we get stuck in this rut that says, well, this is how it's always been. So sometimes we say, well, we can't um, make this change because it's always been this way or the EMR can't produce the report that we need. Um, it's going to be important for the practice manager to problem solve and try to be a positive um, person when it comes to trying to solve 
the day-to-day -day, um, issues that, that happen in, in the practices. Yeah, those and those issues are daily, that's for sure. You know, I think <clears throat> also having the confidence to have strong communication skills and to use them often so everyone in the clinic is up to date and aware of everything that's going on and how things are progressing and their role in that. You know, timely, recurring, and thorough communication can be a challenge when you're in the environment that we're talking about and you add it to everything else that there is to do as staff and providers. And, and you know, these, these folks are busy taking care of patients as, as well. So sometimes it takes a creative mind to figure out how best to communicate and, and to bring consistency into that communication so the team is able to rely on how they will be communicated with. And if they haven't had a chance to check their email, they could check that if they're looking to see if something's changed and things of such. Yeah, Julie mentioned um, being ta a taskmaster, and obviously practice managers are, practice managers are taskmasters. But um, one of the things that um, you learn as as you're being a practice manager, you listen to your team and you listen to the providers because they are the ones that are in the trenches and doing the work each and every day. And so um, organizations need to stress that um, maybe teach them how to huddle with their staff one-on-one -on -one or in huddles once a week. Um, the managers can explain, well, this is why we're doing something different than we have always done it. Um, explaining the whys and listening to the individuals is really going to um, help the practice manager be successful. I agree, Shad. And, you know, and I think uh, the resilience is also important. Recognize how fluid situations can be and you might have heard Shad's having a little bit of trouble with his internet, so once in a while his voice has sounded a little bit uh, sketchy. And, and those are the types of things that managers deal with every day and how they're going to make everything as smooth and efficient for the patients. So uh, striving to understand the, the context in the clinic and, and how it succeeds is really important. And recalibrating things start to veer off, if they start to veer off course, you know, help the team get it back together and keep going. And um, front and tackle, I guess, is, and block and tackle and pass and tackle, just tackle all of the issues is the important part. So um, really, we, we yeah, think the most important tackle. goal of leadership development is often the ability to change behavior in your team and increase their skills and knowledge and create leaders that want to learn and grow. So that communication and that drive for performance and doing the right thing is, is really an important component for these leaders. Perfect. And I apologize for the internet. Of course, as uh, I'm problem solving as we speak, our, my internet went out and I'm using my hotspot on my phone. So, all right. So we have our first polling question that I think Hillary might help us with. But Julie, I don't know if you want to read that off for us. And I sure do, Chad. So the question is, um, what level of formal training, leadership training exists for new and existing managers and directors in your organization? And uh, as you can see, a, informal on the job training, mentorship program, leadership classes, or none. So we appreciate you guys answering these questions. It, it really helps us to have some context as we keep talking with you. Yeah, there's no judgment because every organization is different. Yes, yes. They're coming in. It's really exciting. I love it. Um, <laughs> Looks like um, st still got a few more coming in, so give it a minute. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right. If you would, please. Um, it looks like informal on the job training is the response about 74% of the time. Um, leadership classes, is also high in response, about 42% are doing those. Uh, mentorship programs, about 16%, and no training at all is about 11%. So very interesting, um, the different things. You know, the hospital that I worked at before I came to Stroudwater, we launched a mentorship program with some real structure. And it, it is a great thing for leaders to have someone, uh, even just someone to bounce off problems and, and different solutions when they're new to the role. So 
um, those are, are great considerations in helping your leaders continue to evolve. Julie, can you see this next slide about rural markets? You know, I can talk about Shad's internet, but I was having the same, I had a little blip as well, nothing changed. So individuals may have strong clinical experience, but they may not have the personality or qualifications to successfully manage a practice. And I know a lot of times we don't want to think that, but taskmasters are not always the strong leader. They, they're not always the, they can juggle some things, but Jugglers of varied levels of knowledge and work to, in the work to be accomplished also have to be able to tackle and consider the coachability and developmental pot potential of candidates that we've talked about. They are able to re relate to the team, how they're able to motivate the team and the providers that want really what makes that leader come to work every day. Is it the quality of care that we're providing in the offices? Um, is it the fact that we're really making um, our patients healthier, it, it could be anything, but um, leaderships include, leadership includes the ability to influence and guide other individuals and team members. And that, that's a strong quality that a lot of people really struggle with. Um, the ability to relate and, com and have comfort in difficult conversations with staff. It's, it's important that we address issues with staff and that we do it in a timely manner. So that comfort important piece. These leaders need to be able to make a difference and and lead the charge. We screen candidates for their ability to embrace the important personal drive and relatable skills that we talk about. Dad, you've had some experience in this. I do, and um, it, it was interesting that a lot of the folks that um, answered the polls said that job training, and so I have a quick little story is that, um, uh, was managing or I was an administrator over several practices. We decided we were going to hire a RN who had worked in practices um, for quite a long time, and we promoted her to the practice manager. And um, so we felt that she would be able to hit the ground running and be able to do ev the everyday things. From a clinical standpoint, she was phenomenal. From a business standpoint, she didn't know what she didn't know. And so I would get six to eight calls per day um, asking about, well, what does this report mean? Or what do I need to do now? Or And so those are the things that we as administrators, sometimes um, we, we make mistakes when we put people in their roles and we don't appropriately train them prior to. So it's really, it, it's really important for organizations to think about picking the right person. And if you pick a, a person, make sure you give them this, the tools to, to be successful. Yeah, the tools and the expectations, it's all very important. It's all very important. So I think we have another fun question for you all. Um, thanks for uh, answering the last one. So historically, have you been satisfied with your clinic manager's ability to establish strong clinic operations? And uh, your choices are very much somewhat very little or you've historically been unsatisfied. Thank you for doing this again. Um, so it looks like you guys were really quick to answer this time, which is great that about one third of you are very satisfied. About 50% are somewhat satisfied, 6% very little and 11% that, very little went up to 11 too, unsatisfied. So if, in the environment that we're talking about, you know, how I think ones that are somewhat very little and unsatisfied is really important so that we are positioning our clinics in the best way for the future as, as healthcare has been very financially challenging post COVID and the changes that I've talked about that are coming, that are there in the clinics that are gonna to continue to come. Working with this manager and this leader to make them the strongest that they can be becomes all the more important. Chad, would you agree? Oh, totally agree, totally agree. So that's why we have this slide that um, 
is, is really important. What the cost of doing nothing, what if an organization doesn't invest in being able to help managers understand their roles, responsibilities, expectations, and how to grow? So I mentioned earlier, organiz if organizations don't provide managers with a toolbox of ideas, you're going to see a, a slew of things on the slide there. Work, a workflow inefficiencies. If they don't understand how patient flow should work, that's going to um, probably impact volume. It's going to impact um, just overall engagement of your of your team. So you just want to uh, make sure that the practice manager has the tool tools to be successful. Again, this is the cost of doing nothing, and it's it's really important. It it really is. It really is. I agree. You know, and and count, accountability. We we all talk about accountability, but, but really are we tackling accountability? They need to feel, you know, individuals may feel there is low or no accountability for themselves or for their team. And leaders need to establish and set the platform for why we do what we do and why doing the right thing is so important for these patients, especially in these times of staff turnover and challenges in the recruiting space. The stability and ownership that a team demonstrates or, or doesn't demonstrate and how they get things done can have a, a strong impact on turnover and performance. So it's, it matters that we're holding people accountable so it's not deflating other staff from, from our inability to do that. So efficient, efficiency matters more every day. <laughs> it's, uh, as changes happen every day and we need to take seriously how these insurance companies and, and drug stores um, work to attract clinic patients to their convenient and often free of charge care settings. It's imperative that patients are able to rely on strong clinical performance during their visit and their communication with the offices so we maintain the loyalty that we that these patients and providers have spent years um, building. We realize this may sound repetitive to some degree. However, all of all or many of these things have become more imperative. You can improve and you can succeed with strong clinic leadership. It really has become important that we work to position your clinics for the future. Clinic managers need to have progressed with the value-based changes that are happening in order to stabilize um, your clinics and hospitals for the future. So there we go. That cost of doing nothing. We tried to put this in uh, in value terms so that we uh, really help you understand that there's risk in a being a mediocre clinic. And the darker bars on the left-hand side. I hope that you can see those colors are the average ca cash collections for primary care physicians at these levels of MGMA performance. You can see the 10th, 25th, median, 75th, and 90th percentile. Collect collecting between 500,000 and 700,000 in the dark bars. And the higher form performer clinics, sorry, collecting 1.2 to 1.5 or $1.6 million. So, quite a difference in the levels of performance and, and the things that the clinics can do if they do some of the things that we're talking about. The difference in collections for a strong performing family practice as compared to average as it relates to efficiency, ability to collect on claims, and panel size ranges from $260,000 a year with larger potential to get the average strong practice operations and significant increase of $800,000, $808,000. So there's potential out there for clinics to improve components of clinic operation and, and thereby also uh, help the bottom line. The opportunity here is, is calculated by moving the clinic performance up to the next level. So if you typically compare your clinic to the median practices via the MGM day data that we're talking about, and you improve to the 75th percentile, you have the potential to capture approximately $610,000 more a year in collections and, and wouldn't that be just fabulous to show your leaders on a report so for the purpose of this example let's propose that a pcp practice collects on average more than half a million a strong leader could do a number of things to increase the collections for the practice including increasing patient volumes improving clinical efficiency improving quality improving the patient registration errors if there are errors or prior authorization process, decreasing staff turnover, I think is, is a huge one that we've talked about. And the list goes on and on of ways that a strong clinic leader can impact the bottom line and review the metrics with your clinic managers 
it, it becomes a, an important thing to do monthly to understand the opportunities. And, um, you know, if this is something that you all would like to discuss with us, we would love to do that. Um, obviously, Shad and I have a great interest in this and, and have both worked in the environment. And, you know, the cost of doing nothing is, is it's imperative that your clinic leader have financial accountability for improving the patient outcomes overall. So value-based care is molding both care delivery and care payment by rewarding providers for getting and keeping people healthy. The primary care provider is one of the great ways rural healthcare can impact their own community health. You know, as we see revenue shifting from free for service, value-based care, which the offices have already seen, we see these changes. Right now, 70% of Humana's Medicare Advantage members are under a value-based care arrangement. So we all see the growth in um, Medicare Advantage, and this is exactly where they're going. And, and you can rest assured that Humana would like that to be a larger percentage. We get, how do we help patients get better while keeping costs down? This challenge is here to stay more in the clinics than anywhere else in the, in the healthcare setting. So many of these clinics are a key access point for the hospital, and we need to have regard to that. Ted, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I know we have about five minutes left. Um, this is really something that organizations really need to invest time with their practice managers and providers and teammates to truly understand how is healthcare transitioning to value-based care overall. I just think that that's um, something that a lot of people have heard about, but maybe they don't know the, all the ins and outs, and that's something that hospitals can, can help with. Uh, Stroudwater can assist with that as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and switch to the polling question, if that's okay, Julie, and say good time. Absolutely. So this is our, la um, our last polling question. And uh, the question is, to survive, do clinic providers need to begin the transition from providing health care to ensuring health. Do we need do we need to start thinking about value-based care in your environment? I know that um, rural health care is very different than urban. I'll think. I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm thankful that no one has said no. <laughs> Looks like almost 70, 30, 70% 70 said, yes, we need to be doing this and 30% said somewhat. So, um, you know, the folks that, that feel somewhat, I encourage you to go out to your clinic offices and, and see what may have changed and see if that is coming to your market or if it is a little bit slower as far as the value-based care and the pushing from the insurance companies. Um, my previous role was in a, a rural hospital and um, I was surprised how much of it uh, was very, very active in our clinics. Dad, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. It's um, it's it's coming whether we li like it or not. Um, but a lot of um, issues with rural communities that we see is that there's a lack of uh, reporting and a lack of transparency with how are we doing in these certain areas. And that's really going to be important for organizations to help make your manager successful by providing them with information of how are they doing on mammograms, pap smears, colonoscopies, um, all of those. They need the data to be able to make significant change going forward. True. We need to offer low cost care. We need to manage the patient's health, as I said, and, and the patient's cost with actionable data. And I know that some of our EMRs are very challenging. Sometimes we have to just track some of those things manually to see how we're doing. You know, we need to evaluate and plan for care delivery um, and, and change things as necessary to succeed in this new, this new way. So, um, you know, payers are looking for the lowest cost environment to send your patients to. So it, it, it is important to, to keep that top of mind. You know, we are, we have two minutes left. I wondered, um, we do have our key takeaways here, the benefits of developing a clinic leader. 
um, to establish the things that we've really that we've really talked about. I wanted to see if anybody has any questions before we let you all go to lunch. I know there were a few there. There we go. Okay, so we had some issues with the screen. All right, great. Well, if you have um, any questions, please feel free to contact Shad and I. I think if, if this. Actually, um, just use your cell phone real quick to uh, take a picture of the QR code, and then you can always get in touch with us. And even if you just want to have a discussion, about how things are going at your hospital or um, how things aren't going at your hospital. We'd be happy to, to talk with those of you out in the field and make sure that we understand. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, we'd be happy to, I just would love to interact and, and hear what's what's going on out in the in the. Oh, he cut out a little bit. He, we would just love to hear from you. So if you can, um, Please, please feel free to reach out either via um, email or telephone, and we look forward to, to talking with you soon. Thanks for again for joining us for these conferences. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Chad and Julie, and thank you everyone for participating. We're, we're happy to have you with us, and please fill out the survey if you have a minute. We, uh, we really value your feedback, and we're always trying to improve. Have a good day, everyone.